Well, this morning, I want to try to talk about both of these passages a little bit. I'm going to spend most of my time on the Jeremiah passage that Chris read to you a moment ago, but also referring to the one that I read, which is from the Gospel of Luke, because they both have ways of touching into one another, and they interleave in a couple of different places, and I'll note that as, as we go along. I want to start with Jeremiah, though. And in some ways, it's probably a little confusing what was going on there, so I need to give a little bit of background, because Jeremiah is talking for God and saying that God is going to bring them a new covenant and going to write it on their heart and all that. And I'm not sure how much all of us know about what the old covenant was about and why this had to take place when it did. So here's this. Um, as actually as that happens, there are a number of covenants in what we call the Old Testament that Jews call just the scriptures, <laughs> but we call it the Old Testament scriptures. And during those, those eras, there's a number of covenants. There's one covenant that God made with Abraham. There's another covenant that God made with Moses, another covenant that God made with Noah. There's a lot of them out there. This one refers to the covenant with uh, Moses. And you can tell that when it says that God's saying, it's not like the covenant I made before with your ancestors when I took you by the hand and brought you out of the land of Egypt. Well, that's, that's Moses. That's what Moses did. So the covenant he's talking about is the Moses kind of covenant. Where Moses is up on top of the mountain. Now, when we think of Moses going to the top of Mount Sinai, you think of Moses getting the laws, you know, on the two tablets, the Ten Commandments, and he also got a truckload of other laws that we hear about through the rest of Leviticus and Deuteronomy and all of those. Lots and lots and lots and lots of laws. But underneath all of those laws that Moses got on top of the mountain, there is the covenant. The covenant is kind of like the binding principle that empowers you and enables you and allows you and charges you to obey those laws. And you see this covenant all over the Old Testament, especially in those first five books, but in other places as well. And Jesus quotes it and the Apostle Paul quotes it. In different ways, you'll recognize this guiding principle, which I'm going to share with you in a second, that is underlying all of the other things. As a matter of fact, uh, Bible scholars sometimes call this thing the, the, uh, the spinal cord of the Old Testament or the Bible in general. This is the, the, the backbone upon which everything else depends. That may not be quite true, but it's really close to being true. Almost every other principle and law comes from this. You go on top of the mountain and Moses is going to walk away with these apodictic laws and these casuistic laws. You all know what those are, don't you? Not a soul, huh? Don't worry. <laughs> Lots of different kinds of laws that are there, right? This is what allows you to be able to follow those things. You caught that, huh? I did. <laughs> Our seminary students have been studying that recently. Here it is. In different forms, you'll hear this saying in different places throughout the Bible where God will be speaking and say, with a mighty arm, and an outstretched hand, and by the way, a couple of times where it says there's a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, I don't know why, but they varied a little bit. Mighty arm and an outstretched hand, I rescued you, or sometimes it's I redeemed you, sometimes it's I saved you, I liberated you, whatever. I liberated you from slavery in Egypt, or sometimes it's the flesh pots of Egypt. I'm not sure what that means, but God re redeemed you from them anyway, got you out of Egypt, and therefore, and here's the important part, because I redeemed you, because I saved you, because I rescued you, therefore, you should go, and then they make a long list, go and, and help the poor and the invalid and the elderly and the widows and the orphans and the illegal aliens. That's actually on the list. You should go and rescue the illegal aliens that are living amongst you, and you should do for them what I did for you. Because I saved you from slavery, you need to go and make the world a less enslaved place. That underlies every other law. You do it to others because God did it to you. God lifted you up, so therefore your job, I should say, my job, our job, <laughs> the job of all of us who are people of that faith, our job is to go and do likewise and make the world a place when there's not as many people who are, in fact, enslaved 
By the way, I'm working with an organization right now that is dealing with modern day slavery, human trafficking, sex slavery, those kinds of things, is really rampant around the world. In fact, there's a half a dozen of them they've uncovered in Boston. It is a under the table crime that is awful, still going on today. And I could say more directly in that case, that we rescue them because God rescued us. And God rescued us from God knows what we might have been what place we might have gone into, what pit we might have dug for ourselves, and God rescued us from going that direction. Therefore, our job is try to make sure there's a smaller number of people in the world after we're gone that are in that same mix. That's what it is. That's the backbone. That's the spinal cord of all of our religion. Jesus uses that later on in a number of different ways. Remember the parable where uh, Jesus tells a story about this guy who got behind on paying his bills and the debts went higher and higher to the king of all people. And the king finally goes down to him and says, all right, you can't pay your, your debts. Therefore, I'm going to throw you into debt prison to pay them off that way. And the guy says, oh, have mercy on me, O king, because I can't pay it. My wife will be impoverished if you do that. And so the king has mercy on him. Remember that story? So the king lets him go. He's off. He's gone. And so he goes off down the road and he sees somebody owes him some money. <laughs> and he grabs that guy by the collar and throws him in jail for not paying the bills to the middle person. The king gets wind of this and says, Hey, I saved you. You're supposed to do the same thing to somebody else. What are you doing out there? Going and throwing somebody else in jail for, for debts. And I saved you from your own debts. And, and you're supposed to, don't you understand the program? <laughs> the way this is supposed to work. I helped you, therefore you helped. And the guy didn't do it. So the king says, I'll show you. And he grabs that guy and throws him in jail after all. You're going to go do your time in jail in spite of what I've said about forgiving you. You don't deserve it. It's pretty harsh. The Apostle Paul over in, in Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. I just said that to impress you that I know those numbers. I could be making it up. You don't know. The Apostle Paul says that we are not saved by the good works that we do. They didn't get to save you. Anybody can do that for selfish reasons. But we are saved so that we will be able to do good works for the world. We are first redeemed, and therefore we're all able to go out and do good in the world around us. That's interesting, isn't it? That's the same principle. God saved us, therefore we save others. God lifted us up, therefore we lift up others. God rescued us from who knows what, and therefore we rescue people around us. I'm going to tell you, by the way, that when this principle got laid down, when they got into, into uh, uh, the promised land, into Palestine, for centuries, the people of Israel really did have the most egalitarian, equal, sharing, helpful, humanitarian culture almost anywhere in the world, maybe anywhere in the world. Historians are not sure about that exactly, but it certainly was close to being the most fair and just system that there was anywhere in that time. They even had a thing that was very, very close to democracy. They always would vote on the judges that would be ruling, and the judges would always retire at the end of their term, <laughs> which you don't see much in most places. It was an interesting kind of a system. Even women, I know it's, it's not quite, it's, there's no women's liberation movement going on in the Old Testament. Even women were lifted up during that period of time. If you fell down, the whole clan would gather around you and pull you back in and, and, and help you out in some way or another. And you get stories about Ruth and Naomi who were really kind of models of the time. My favorite is, is the, uh, uh, um, who's the woman, there was a woman who was the a general in the army and Deborah. Deborah was a general in the army, and she led the troops. By the way, interestingly enough, I think I've mentioned this before, but the person that was her second lieutenant underneath her, his name was Barak. Who would have, who would have thought, right? <laughs> but anyway, Deborah led the troops. You wouldn't see that in any other country in the world. But they did in Israel, because it was, it was a little bit closer to a more egalitarian country, really had a, had a way that nobody ever was desperately poor. As a matter of fact, their oldest history, not necessarily when it happened, but when they're writing about their oldest history, which is the book of Genesis, the, old, the history of the oldest part of their lives, the word poverty never shows up anywhere in the entire book of Genesis. Did you know that? So their understanding of their history was that was not when there was anybody that was poor. Poverty occurred later on. 
And it occurred because some of these people got a little bit of money and thought, this is kind of nice. I'd like to have a little bit more of that money, and I can't have too much money because the guy underneath me wants some of my money, so I'll just push him down, and I'll make a little more, and I'll, I'll pass some laws. So this guy over here will always be poorer than I will, and I will always be richer. And it got wider and wider and wider until after two or three centuries. There was a tiny pinprick at the top of the economic ladder, and all of the rest of the country was on the very verge of starvation all the time. That's what it was. A terrible, terrible place. You ever wonder why it is in the New Testament when Jesus is always going around feeding hungry people? You know, there's the feeding of the 5,000, feeding of the 4,000, feeding of the 8,000. There's six of these feeding stories all together in the Gospels. You ever wonder why? There's always thousands of people wandering around because they're hungry? Because they're homeless, and they are, in fact, hungry. They've got no jobs, no income, and they're close to starving. And so one of the most important things Jesus did during those days was break the loaves and fishes and share a little bit with them all the rest of the time. It was a grim place and a grim time. One of the ways that the, the, uh, some of the more powerful people would get their income, and I just, there's lots of ways you could tell a story. I'm going to give just this one because it ties in with the story that Luke tells, Luke tells, Jesus telling in the Gospel of Luke, and that is that they would steal it from widows. They would steal land and property and income from widows. Because if someone from male dies, his wife was not allowed to go to work. Do you know that? The women were not even allowed to have a job back in the day. They couldn't. They were not allowed. To. The only job that women were allowed to have was as a prostitute. That's true. Is anything so disgustingly self-serving than that? Only job they could have. Oh, that, of course, they could always be a beggar in the streets. So when a woman loses her husband, she's just out of luck. In the old days, the whole family would gather around them, bring her in, you know, and they'll help her out. And they didn't do that later on. It got worse and worse and worse. So whenever someone's uh, husband died, uh, she would be in a hard time. She'd have to go to somebody to take out a loan to help pay the bills. And, of course, the person would say, of course, I will loan you that money for only 400% interest. Don't worry about a thing. And then, of course, when they had time to pay the bills back, the woman still wouldn't have any money. And so they would confiscate her property and they'd send her into the streets and she would become a prostitute or a beggar. That's probably what's going on behind the story that Jesus tells here, this parable. Don't know for sure, but here's a woman who's a widow, and by definition, widow almost always means poor. So there's a woman who is a widow, and she's poor, and someone has wronged her in some way. It doesn't say what that is. Probably this is what it was. Someone is trying to swindle her out of her home. So she's going to the judge, and she says, help me, this is unjust. And the judge is a scumbag. I mean, you know, I can make... I can put lipstick on that pig, but he's still a pig. He really is. This judge doesn't love God and doesn't love people. He loves himself. This, this judge is supposed to be doing justice, and this judge is doing nothing, except maybe he would help out one of his buddies or somebody who was rich or somebody who was wealthy or somebody who gave a donation to his reelection campaign, something. Does this sound familiar? And this woman who was nobody came up to him, and he didn't even care until she came back again, and again, and again, and again, until finally he says, I've got to do something or she's going to kill me. <laughs> I've got to stop this lady. She's going to drive me crazy. She's going to humiliate me in front of my friends. She's torturing me. So finally, he does justice for whatever that crime was that's going on. That's the judge. And that's the way that people would steal from poor people back in those days, by taking their, their land away from them. One of the ways. Okay, that's the, that's the bedrock, that's the background of Jeremiah going to the people here and telling them this story. This was at the end of the Babylonian captivity. I'm not sure how much all of you know about that, but it's a period of time when the people of Israel lost a war and they were captured by Babylonia, which is modern-day Iraq, more or less, and taken over their whole cloth, some 50, 60,000 of them, and they stayed there for 50 years until they finally Iraq, Babylonia, was conquered by Persia. And they threw, threw out the old king, and they allowed all the people to go home. Toward the end of that, Jeremiah comes and brings these words to the people, saying, you know, that old covenant didn't work. <laughs> I'm sorry. It just didn't work out too well. You people just didn't obey that covenant. You people just got bad. I had this nice idea, but you didn't, didn't believe it. You didn't follow it. So therefore, I'm going to give you a new covenant. We're going to try this again. And by the way, as I said before, there's lots of other covenants. This is like covenant number six that God is going to try on the people. I'm going to try a new covenant. And this time, 
the words, the content is not going to change, but the mold is going to change. This time, I'm not going to carve it on some tablets, you know, some stone things, write it all down in stone. I'm not going to do that. This time, I'm going to write it on your heart. And you can never, ever again say that you don't know it. You can't say, I haven't heard that, because it's written on your heart. It's in your, it's in your blood system. It's in your genetic code. From now on, my covenant with you is going to be on your heart. You can't get away from it. He, he says specifically, you can't say, go teach me that. You can't learn it. You can't just say, well, I'm going to memorize a bunch of Bible verses, which, by the way, is not a bad idea unrelated to this, but that isn't going to help. You can't go memorize the Nicene Creed or something. You can't do that. That isn't going to help because it's going to be carved on your heart. It's in your genetic code. It's in your soul. So from now on, you will always, always, always know what it is. Jesus says in chapter 11, verse 1 of the Gospel of, of John, that if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. That's kind of the same thing. If you really, really love Jesus, you really do, if you really have that relationship with the risen Lord that we're supposed to have, then you may not know all the laws, but you'll get really close to obeying all of them because you'll have the love as your guidance. That's the same kind of thing. It's going to be in your heart. You'll be in your heart, and it'll always be there. Now let me go back to the parable again. I'm going to close with this. If you're like me and 98% of all the people in the world who've read the Bible, you probably think that most of the time whenever Jesus does a parable where there's a powerful person and a not-so-powerful person, then the powerful person is God. We, we just do that. And it's, it's true almost all the time. I'll give you an example. You know the story of the prodigal son. Did that a couple of weeks ago, right? And the prodigal son, the father is a symbol for God. The prodigal ran off as us. We come back again to God, and the father welcomes us. That's God. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Okay? Remember the story of the, the woman who had the ten coins. Lost one of the coins, looked around all over the house, found the coin. The woman is God in there who's seeking out the lost, right? Uh, the story of the, of the shepherd who lost one of his sheep. Went all across the countryside trying to find the sheep. Finally found the sheep, had a big old party. The shepherd is God. We're the sheep. We got lost. God found us. That's clear. You, you, you know what I'm talking about. Those parables are all over the Gospels. However, what do you do with this one? When the powerful person in this story is such a wretched beast. He's such a bum. How do you say that's God. You ever thought about that? You read this parable before and never wondered, never asked that question? Oh, I don't feel like that's God to me. And I got to tell you, <laughs> an awful lot of, of uh, priests and pastors and scholars and theologians and Bible scholars have been wrestling for thousands of years trying to shoehorn God of love image into this horrible, wretched human being and make it sound good. It's just, it's difficult to do that because it just doesn't fit the mold, does it? I think it's because they're all wrong. They've missed the point of the parable. And by the way, let me say, I didn't make this up. I'm not bright. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm no genius. I read this. Somebody else told me. This is good, though. <laughs> this is good. That the, the rich judge is not God. God, in this particular story, is the old widow. He's us. The judge is the one, bless you, judge is the one who has fallen away, who doesn't love people, doesn't love God, only loves himself, looking out for number one. That's the judge. That's you and me, isn't it? I mean, we, we really are like that. Now, we have, some of us are better than others about hiding that, <laughs> but that's what we are. And, and the chips are down. We want ourselves to win. We want people to love us. We want to be the ones who are respected. We do. Sometimes we do nice things. Sometimes we do nice things only because we want people to like us for having done those nice things. We're kind of like the judge. Some are better, some are worse, but that's kind of where we are. That's what we call original sin. That's what we are. And the woman is like God, who just badgers us until we finally cave in and do the right thing. Isn't that right? The woman is the one, is, is God who comes in and just comes after us again and again and says, you know what you're supposed to do. You know what's good. It's written on your heart. I wrote it on your heart centuries ago. It's there. It's in your genetic code. You know what you need to be doing. You're just too lazy to do it. That's the woman. That's God coming to us and reminding us of the covenant, 
again and again and again and again till he, she finally wears us down and we do the right thing. I can't tell you. I can't tell you how many times <laughs> I have been over my office working away on some great project that's going to help the church and it's going to do good for so many people. I'm going to put together a Bible study. I'm going to put together a preaching series. I'm going to put together Advent. I'm going to do some kind of a wonderful thing and someone comes in and interrupts me because they need something. And I'm mad at them. They need, oh, my, sorry, i got a really horrible problem. I need your help. And I don't want to help them. I'm trying to do good for the church. I can't tell you how many times God has knocked on my door and said, sorry, but there's someone out here who really needs your help. And I said, no, because I'm too lazy to go do it because I'm working on some other big who knows what kind of a project. Because i got my own stuff to do. We all do. And God comes to us in the face of this woman, or it may be a child, or it may be someone who is sick, it may be someone who is crying, someone just lost her husband, or just lost her, uh, his wife, uh, someone may have just lost their sister. And that voice that calls out to you, reminds you of the covenant that is written on your heart, that voice is God's voice. Don't ever forget that. That God can come and will come when you least expect it, when you're not looking for God, you don't want to find God because you're too busy doing something for yourself. And God will come and badger you until you recognize the covenant written on your heart. And your honest to good goodness will finally come forth. God saved us, rescued us, redeemed us, liberated us, lifted us, and there we need to, therefore, we need to go and do likewise and make a world where there's a smaller number of people who need to be rescued. Go in peace, my friends, and do likewise. Amen.